I'm just going to add to that reading because um, this morning there was a second reading and I actually refer to both of them in my uh, sermon. So I'm just going to read a short five verses. So it comes from Acts uh, chapter 7. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Well, we've had lots of festivities uh, this weekend, and I was wondering, after all the festivities of yesterday, um, I wonder what the king and queen were longing for most. And I bet it was something along the lines of kicking off their shoes, finding a comfortable chair, and having a cuppa in a place that they call home. And we all know that feeling, don't we? At the end of a holiday, maybe, at the end, even, even if it's a really good holiday, at the end of a long day or a hard day, um, you just want to get home and relax. Now, home should be, and I am aware that this is not always true, but it should be a safe haven, a place of comfort, and a place we can be completely ourselves. The passage that E.J. read from the gospel is a place they call home, that's called home for eternity. The one the Father has for us and Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us and will come one day and take us to be there. It's a favorite uh, funeral passage, uh, those first six verses. And it does bring us comfort and hope in this life. But there's something else here that I think in some ways is more important and more significant, although I am not diminishing the fact that Jesus died to save us and we spend the eternity with God. I do think that's amazing. But maybe something for this life. And I think Jesus is showing us the importance of relationships as home. A place where we can be completely ourselves. And we all know those people in our lives that make us feel at home. And it doesn't have to be a parent or a partner. It can be in addition or in place of, I guess, um, those. It's those people that really put us at ease, where we can be completely ourselves with them. We can feel what we feel, up or down. We can make mistakes and it doesn't matter. They love us no matter what? We laugh together, we cry together, we get angry sometimes, but mostly we are able to just be together. Those are the people that we get drawn to that hold us, and we love them for that. And it's a love that grows over a lifetime. We may be lucky enough to have more than one person that is that space called home. Maybe they come in seasons of our lives. Maybe they are there all our lives. And nothing is more precious. It grounds us, protects us, guides us. And for the disciples in this, in this time, Jesus was that person for them. Jesus was that safe space, home for them. Jesus, fully human, their friend, their teacher, soon to be their Messiah. Well, he was the Messiah but follow through on his calling. And he spent all this time with the disciples, but now the time has come for, he, for him to fulfill the calling, and that means he will no longer be with them. Their safe space that they found in a relationship with him will no longer be in that same form. Because his calling is to come and to die for them and for us. And it needs to be fulfilled in order for us to have a safe space in eternity one day. When it says he's going to prepare a place for us, he's not setting up furniture 
or making tea and waiting for us on the side. His preparation was death on the cross and his resurrection and ascension. He prepares a place for each of us because he is our access to God the Father. He has to die, take on the sin of the world, so that we are forgiven of everything and that we can have that safe place. And we know in life, as with, with our earthly relationships, that there is a time of presence and a time of absence. The presence brings joy. And absence needs trust and hope and fidelity, a holding on to what we know to be true and awaiting. That presence and absence in earthly life can be the fact that you don't see that person every day or there's time between phone calls and you have to trust that that person is still going to be that person that you know and is there for you the next time you pick it up. When it comes to fidelity, it's that faithfulness to that person, that holding on to that friendship, that relationship. And what is true then for our human relationships is also true of our relationship with God. The disciples had known the joy of being in Jesus' presence. They had absolutely experienced this, but now in his absence, they were going to have to trust and hope and have fidelity, stay faithful to Jesus and his teaching in order for him to take them home. Verse 3, and I go to prepare a place for you. I will come back and I will take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Where he is now at the right hand of the Father, he will take us to be with him. Some translations say it's slightly different. They say he will come and he will draw us to himself. And I love that imagery. It's a kind of, um, it, it's so gentle and kind and thoughtful, isn't he? He's going to scoop us up and draw us and take us home to that safe space for eternity. But the good news is we don't have to wait to die to get that safe space. With Jesus, we have that here because he promises the disciples and us, and we will celebrate celebrate it in a couple of weeks' time on the day of Pentecost, that he will send us a helper, a comforter, an encourager. He sends us the Holy Spirit who is within us and dwells within us, which is God's presence with us every day, bringing that joy until the time comes that Jesus takes us home. Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The absence of Jesus is going to draw them closer to God as they trust and as they hope. Because having experienced that life with Jesus, there is that longing to have him back, the longing to be back with him. That saying, absence makes the heart grow fonder. As we yearn for Christ, our life becomes a life of trust and hope and fidelity as we desire to be in his presence. The problem is with our lives these days, is that we so easily get distracted from intentionally being in the presence of God. And so we give up hope when things don't go our way. We allow other things to get in the way and draw us away. It's in the waiting where that fidelity is, where we remain faithful to Jesus, where we keep trusting even when everything else doesn't look like that God is there with us. It's that space of trust and hope that he deepens our faith and we know his promise is true. And we need to nurture that love. We need to nurture that so that we can keep doing his will. We have to do that through reading the scriptures for being here like today and worshiping together. Corporate worship is so important for our faith and for that waiting to help us to trust and hope. It is our times of praying, it is our times of meditating. And as we do those things more regularly each day, the well of desire for God's will 
will deepen within us. And that yearning one day to be with him will increase until such time as he does take us home. We've all experienced those times in our faith when we've known that God has been present with us. It may be through watching somebody else. It may be answered prayer. It may be just that peace we feel within us. We may have had an experience of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. We may have been healed of something. Sometimes it's an emotion we experience. I, I, I quite often find with people... Um, not only people early on in their faith, actually. Sometimes it's people that are maybe ones that are not used to showing their emotions, and they say, I don't know what it is. When I come into church at the moment, I'm crying. And it is just the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, melting our hearts in those moments. As we seek Him, we will find Him, and we will long for more. Verse 11 said, Believe me when I say I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. I was like, Jesus knows us so well, doesn't he? He knows us that for the most part, as our faith has developed and matured, we're going to trust and hope and remain faithful to him. I do think we get to a point where we know there's ups and downs in life. We know God is always there. And, and we're not going to lose our faith over a really bad time, one, one prays not. But I, I think we do reach that maturity and that, have that confidence that he's there. But honestly, sometimes it really doesn't feel like it. And sometimes it really doesn't feel like you can pray and pray and pray and nothing's getting answered. Like, where is he? And so I love this because he knows that we may struggle to just believe that the Father is in him and he is in the... Uh, I am in the Father and the Father in Him. He knows that that belief may wane a little bit or may have a little bit of doubting Thomas. And so he says to us, well, if you can't do that, at least believe in the works you've seen. Because when we think on the things he's done and the things we know him to have done in those times in his presence, then it's much easier to remind ourselves, isn't it? And to strengthen our faith and to hold on to trust and hope, even if it's by a thread. And I think that is gracious as he knows us in the suffering. And we do have those things that cause doubt, like the pain, the suffering. Un I mean, look at the suffering in the world. We wonder where God is. Unanswered prayer and persecution for our beliefs. As we remember the works, then we will know his presence. And then out of that comes our calling. When we're in his presence, we get to understand what he's asking us to do, how he's wanting us to live. And we live at our calling by the things we do and by who we are. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. You see, Jesus can no longer be those hands and feet on earth because he is at the right hand of the Father. He has us filled with the Holy Spirit. The mission of Christ that he began all those years ago continues through us. We have to meet the needs of a broken world. We reveal the love and the heart of God to people. We become the presence of God where he is absent in this world because his Holy Spirit lives in us. We bring his joy, we bring his healing, we bring his comfort because he works through us. And as the Father gave Jesus that authority and that direction and he was able to do what he did here on earth, we have that same authority and that same ability to do those works. And so the greater things that he talks about is there's more of us than Jesus as we go out into a world absent of him. There in that safe place that we know to be home, we make a home for others. We are that safe person that makes a home for others because we love with a different love. We find a new strength to do the works of God. We love those we couldn't love before. We forgive those who maybe we couldn't forgive before. We befriend those who are different. We learn to be open to those who do things differently and believe things differently. 
and we learn and they are able to stand up for those things we never thought we could stand up for because he is present in us and we bring his presence. But it's not for our glory, it's for his glory. It's so that we can see his glory here on earth and that we glorify him and reflect it back to him. St. Arrhenius says this, the glory of God is in human, the human being fully alive. The glory of God is in the human being fully alive. Isn't that wonderful? We can only be fully alive with Jesus. That relationship is how we can go beyond what we imagine for the gospel. Look at uh, the passage of Stephen that I read. In the worst moment of persecution, I think it is one of the most powerful passages when we look at it. I was um, given this to preach on as my, uh, my farewell sermon at St. John's the day after I was ordained. And I thought, I wondered what that was about. So, you know, let's have someone stoned and let's preach on that. But actually, as I meditated on it and I looked at it, I, I get so excited about this passage because God's power shines through and his glory shines through. Because here's Stephen at the moment of stoning just before he does that. He has the strength because he looks up and he sees God's glory. The Bible, the verse says 55, he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then instead of keeping quiet, because you do think, I mean, you do think in those moments that you're about to get killed for your faith, you'll just shut up and not say anything. No, not Stephen. The glory of God is so overwhelming. What he's seeing and what he's about to enter is so amazing. He says, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He tells everyone, because there, as Stephen looks up to the heavens, is the way the truth, and the life. And he is there to welcome him in to the place he has prepared for him. When we do the works of God, when we live this life of faith, we will glimpse God's glory in all we do. But nothing will compare to the glory of God, we will one day see when the doors of heaven open for us and we fully see the glory of God that we are about to enter into. There we will know the fullness of being home. Here we know in part. So in the meantime, I'll leave you with the words of Richard Raw, a Franciscan monk. I love his writings. And he says this, Thank God we get a little chance to dance on the stage of life, to reflect the glory of God back to God. Amen. Amen. Makes heaven exciting, doesn't it?